When it comes to gaming, few things inspire more nostalgia than the shape of a Super Nintendo controller and the colors of a Game Boy DMG. So, putting those things together in a fairly capable handheld should be an easy win, but is a nice package enough to help the RJ353PS stand out from the rest? The RG 353PS sells for $94.99 in the States and it is Linux only. This is one of the ways they were able to cut down costs from the regular 353P. And really not having Android on a handle like this isn't that big of a loss since the majority of things that would take advantage of the Android OS are going to be reliant on a touchscreen and a larger aspect ratio. It has the RK3566 chip, 1GB of LPDDR4 RAM, a 16GB SD card for the OS, plus an extra slot for expandable storage. It has a 3.5 inch 640x480 IPS screen with no touchscreen, Wi-Fi 2.4 and 5G, Bluetooth 4.2, a 3500 milliamp battery that is rated for six hours but you really get more about four to five in real-time use it uses usb type c for charging and it also has a mini hdmi port now let's take a look at the device itself and like i was saying earlier it looks like a super nintendo controller with just some dmg colors which is a good thing because for the most part it's very comfortable for the majority of games you're going to be playing on it it's going to be ideal now the sticks Typical Switch style sticks that Amberdeck uses in their devices, but they are colored to match the D-pad and the bezel, which is a nice attention to detail. And they're nice and recessed, so it makes it very pocketable. The buttons are also your typical Amberdeck buttons, which means they're gonna feel great and they're not gonna go flush with the device when you press them all the way down. So yeah, they feel great, just like Amberdeck buttons usually do. For start and select, we also have a rubber member connection. So really on this device, nothing's really clicky other than function and power, but it's a very soft click. The D-pad, as always with Amberdick, it's a great D-pad. It feels very retro and it feels right at home in this Super Nintendo style controller. So no complaints there. If I had to pick at something, uh, maybe they're a little too small for the size of the handheld, but it's not something that really gets in the way. On the bottom we have our SD card slots and the first one is going to be for your OS, the second one is going to be for your games, so that's the one you're going to be probably interacting with the most. Since the first one is actually a pretty good quality card and I don't think you're really going to have to switch that one out unless you want to put some custom firmware on there. We also have our headphone jack and on the sides we have nothing, it's nice and smooth. On top, we have the also oh elusive stack shoulder buttons from Ambernick, and I really wish they would use the design in more handhelds because these feel great. Something like the 405 would have been great with this, the 505, really all of their handhelds who just have this setup. These are great. They're not clicky, they're a rubber membrane, but it's a nice tactile feel when you push down on them and you can get an input no matter where you press on these. These are just great stack buttons. So Embernic, please use them more often. I know we're not gonna get analog, but at least, you know, let's get this. Next hit, we have our OTG port, our reset button, our mini HDMI port, our volume rocker, and our USB-C input for charging. On the back, we have the classic Ambernick rubber pads. So not a lot of use for these, unless you want to put this on a table and plug it into a TV. I guess it'll give you a little bit of grip. But other than that, they don't really do much. It's just something Ambernick usually does. It's a signature thing for them at this point. All pretty standard stuff when it comes to Ambernick, other than those beautiful shoulder buttons. But moving on from that, let's talk about the ergonomics of the device itself. Everything about the shape of this handheld tells you that this is a D-pad centered device because the way you hold it, the way your hand sit on top on those buttons just puts everything in the perfect positions for D-pads, face buttons, and shoulder buttons to interact. When you have to use the sticks is when issues start to come up. It's not necessarily uncomfortable to use, it's just uh, your hands feel like they should be grabbing something, like there should be a grip there. So it's just not the most comfortable situation but you can still play for long periods of times with no problems it's just it's going to take a little bit of getting used to with how you grab it for me it tends to sit on the shelf of my middle finger when i'm playing with it so you'll just get used to it just know that it's going to feel a little off at first 
but overall it's a very comfortable device to use for long and game sessions because it is a bigger handheld those nice big circles on the side just makes it sit in your hand a little bit better in comparison to basically any other handheld that uses a three and a half inch screen if i do have to complain about something it's going to be the face buttons they're just a little too small for the size of the side of the handheld if you look at the sn30 pro controller here you can see that it's a lot smaller and i know there isn't a screen in the middle but still it's a lot smaller but the buttons are a lot bigger which just makes it much more comfortable to use when you're trying to get both buttons working at the same time when you're playing something like super mario where you're going to use one for running and the other one for jumping so even something like the frog here which is still the smaller handheld manages to have much larger buttons and i understand the stick for the frog is smaller and the starting select are in different positions but overall there is more than enough room in the 353ps for larger buttons when I'm holding it and I'm pressing down one button, you can see my fingers don't cover up all of the buttons and there's enough room for the tip and the knuckle of my button to make contact with both of them. When I'm holding the 353PS, my finger covers the entire buttons. So now instead of using the front and knuckle, I'm using the whole finger to cover both of them. But really, it's a minor thing and if you've used other handhelds, you're pretty used to this size. Really. It's not something that's going to keep you from enjoying it, but it is something that's worth mentioning when you're discussing the ergonomics of the device itself. Now taking a look at the software, I can happily say that stock is actually a pretty good experience. It's going to be pre-configured for you. You're not going to have to mess around with a lot of settings. So if you're getting this because you're brand new to handhelds and you don't want to mess around with things, but you still want the options to be there in case somewhere down the road you do want to get a little bit more experimental with it this is going to be a great handle to do that with because things just work other than games not being organized in the best way because of some weird naming scheme thing that they tend to use on these sd cards where they put numbers before the game um, you're actually gonna have a pretty good time and once you spend enough time with the handhold you're gonna get pretty used to where things are anyway now what you are missing out on is android and like i said earlier in the video it's not a huge loss because android would really benefit from a larger aspect ratio and a touchscreen two things you are not going to get here so other than playing maybe some ds games with a touchscreen and some slightly better performance on the n64 and dreamcast you're not losing a whole lot of things here which that performance can be made up in some other aspects with some other games. So you lose some, you win some. It's, it's a pretty fair trade, especially with the price difference. Now looking at the actual UI, as you scroll through, you're going to see all of your systems, you're going to see settings, you're going to see options, everything's going to be right there. It's pretty straightforward as to where everything is. And the nice thing is you don't really have to get into any of those options. Everything is pretty well pre-configured for you. But if you do want to get into them, there are some things you can adjust. All you do is press start and you're going to see game options and you can go into game ratios and you can adjust certain things. Or if you go to the system itself, you can go into each emulator and adjust other things there, which we'll touch on a little bit more later on. But yeah, most things are just going to play and you're not going to have to go in and adjust anything. Now, if you do decide to add your own games, as you probably should because you tend to get better quality ROMs, even though I did say this is not a bad experience, it's not going to be the best experience. Now, if you do add those games yourself and you want that box art, all you have to do is go to a website called Screen Scraper, set up an account, and then come back to the device. Make sure you're connected to the internet and go ahead and go down to where it says Scraper. Once you're there, you're going to put in your username and your passport and you're going to select what you want to scrape. If you want to scrape videos, if you want screenshots, if you want box art, the more things you scrape, the longer it's going to take. But if you just want to go ahead and keep it simple, just have some box art there so that it looks nice when you're scrolling through games. That's how you do it. It's going to take a few minutes, but it's a pretty easy thing to fix. And once you're done, everything's going to be nice and organized again. And you're going to have the games that you actually want to play on here versus a massive collection of games that you might not actually ever get to. So that is an option for you, whether you want to just keep what's there and enjoy that or you want to add your own things, you know that's what makes these handhelds great you can go either way 
Now, if there is a game that isn't playing the way you wanted it to, or it's just too slow to be considered playable, you do have some other options. What you're gonna wanna do is go to the game, plus select, game options and then advanced game options and there you're going to be able to pick from other emulators that might make that game a little bit more playable you're also going to have other options like aspect ratio resolution things like that but it is going to be trial and error with some of these systems and this is really only going to happen with the higher end systems things like n64 psp and dreamcast you're gonna have to fiddle around with the games here and there now the majority of those games are gonna work it's just that you're gonna come across certain games like Conker's Bad Fur Day, 007, Rogue Squadron, things like that that aren't going to run smooth right off the bat and you might have to experiment with a couple things. But overall that's a stock experience. It's really not bad and if you're brand new to handhelds and you're kind of worried about flashing things or breaking your device, which isn't really a concern if you follow the right guides, you can actually go with stock and know that you can have a good experience. Now we are going to cover a little bit of Jealous later on down in the video but for now let's get into some of the game testing and what to expect on the actual gameplay with this handheld. And just really quick before we get into the games let's talk a little bit about the hotkeys. If you hold down the function key and the volume buttons you're going to be able to adjust the brightness right there within the game without having to go back into the menu. Besides that, if you hold down function and R1, you're going to create a save state and you're going to get a quick little pop up on the screen telling you what you did. If you press function and L1, you're going to go ahead and save state. Function and L2 is going to fast forward and press it again to turn it off. And then function and R2 is going to show you your FPS. Press it again so we get the right number on screen since we are fast forwarding. And then if we go ahead and press function and A, it's going to go ahead and pause the game. Function B is going to open up the RetroArch menu and finally Function Y is going to create a screenshot. Now if you wanted to get out of a game, all you have to do is hold down Function and Start and that's going to go ahead and exit the game and bring it right back into the menu. Now when it comes to actually playing games on the RJ353PS, everything up to PlayStation 1 is pretty much going to be pick your game and enjoy. Because luckily the chip in here is more than powerful enough for any of those systems. So you're going to be able to just pick your game and start playing without having to fuss about it. Which is really a great experience because a lot of times we spend more time actually trying to set these things up than actually enjoying the games that we bought it for. Now systems from the PlayStation 1 on down isn't the only thing we're able to do on this system but anything past that point you start to have to compromise on certain things now for some of them the compromise isn't that big it could be something as small as having to adjust a little setting here or there but on other systems you're limited by the controls available like for example with DS you have more than enough power to play any game in the DS library, however, since we don't have a touchscreen and we're only working with a 4x3 aspect ratio screen, we don't have enough space to put a second screen right next to it without ending up with a very small image. So what you end up having to do here is play games that really only need one screen at a time, like Pokemon games, or you end up having to find patches for certain games that make it to where you can play with just physical buttons. Luckily, there's quite a few games that have these type of patches. Uh, they tend to be some of the more popular games that are limited by the touchscreen, and you are going to have to do some digging in order to find them if you really want to take advantage of DS on this system. For example, Castlevania Dawn of Sorrows, uh, Zelda Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks all have patches so that you don't have to use touch and you're able to play the game. Or the other option is going with things like Phoenix Wright which are games that you're not going to need best inputs on so you're able to play them at your own pace. Those types of games are going to do really well on the system. Now moving on to something that tends to give these budget handhelds a hard time, we have N64. But luckily, things have come a long way since the days of the RK3326 where we were struggling to get good gameplay on 64. For the majority of games, you're going to be able to load them up and play them right away. That doesn't mean that every single game is going to be like that, so you do have to keep that in mind. I wouldn't necessarily call N64 a bonus, but I also wouldn't call it a feature because compatibility just isn't going to be there for every single game. For the higher end things like Conquest Bad Fur Day, 007, Rogue Squadron, they're all going to be playable, 
but you are going to have to adjust certain things and you're going to have to understand that they're not going to be smooth so this is probably one of those areas where the android side would have been beneficial but it's okay because we do have options for example if you find a game that isn't going to be running very well what you could do is from the main menu pick the system you want to adjust press select go to game options and then go to advanced game options and here you're going to be able to pick from different course and emulators that are pre-installed so you might want to go in there and try out a couple different ones and see if one of them gives you the performance that you're after and sometimes you can take a game from just being unplayable to being playable unfortunately this isn't going to be the case for every game as you can see here with cruising usa no matter what i did i wasn't really able to get a good frame rate but like i said earlier this isn't the case with all games and the majority of the things that you want to play your mario 64 your zelda game your mario kart they're all going to play and they're all going to be smooth a psp performance was surprisingly good the majority of games that i tested ran just fine without having to adjust anything the only real downside here is that we don't have the best screen for psp since we only have a 4x3 screen and a lot of the games look pretty small but if you're okay with that then yeah psp is going to be pretty solid on the rg353 ps now just like with n64 you do have to remember that not every game is going to run right away and with some of the higher end games you are going to have to adjust some things luckily the ppss pp emulator is very customizable and it has a lot of options for lower end systems so for example with god of war if you try to just load it up and play it that way it's not going to work great it's going to be very patchy and it's going to be very slow pretty much as soon as you start the game you're going to get a warning that it's running slow but if you go into the settings you can actually limit the frames and add a frame skip if necessary to get the game running a lot better now, personally, I want to stay away from frame skip if possible, but if you really want to play some God of War on here, then yeah, it is going to be an option because once you adjust those things, the game is going to run much, much smoother. I would recommend trying to run it with just the frames being limited before adding frame skip, but if for whatever reason you still can't get it to run all the way, go ahead and give that a go. In general though, I was very surprised with how good PSP was running. It might be a little bit of work to get everything to work right, but really that's part of the fun with these types of handhelds. And if this is going to be your only system, that work is definitely worth it to get the most out of it. Now moving on to our final system, we're going to talk a little bit about Dreamcast and there's really not a lot to say here. Most of what I tried to play just played. I didn't really have to adjust anything. Now this isn't to say Dreamcast is going to be perfect because I'm sure there are going to be some games that just aren't going to play at full speed but chances are if there's a Dreamcast game you want to play you're going to be able to do it right away here without having to really adjust anything and like I said earlier that is a great place to be when you're talking about a small handheld or really any system but especially when you're talking about a small budget handheld that you're going to be able to carry around with you you want to be able to just pull it out really quick load up a game and just enjoy the experience but in the spirit of full disclosure my exposure to dreamcast games is pretty limited mostly i end up playing things like sonic adventure tony hawk's pro skater um, marvel vs capcom that's really about it some crazy taxi so there might be some deeper cuts that aren't gonna work that great if you do want to see more dreamcast testing we have other videos on other handhelds using the same chip so you can get a better idea that way but from what i did play i can say i had a pretty good time now before we wrap things up, there is one last thing I want to talk about and that is custom firmware. Right here I'm going to be showing a little bit of Jealous and it's going to be a very light overview because this video is already getting pretty long and like I said earlier, I think the stock firmware is a good enough experience for most people if they just want to pick up an inexpensive handheld and just hit the ground running and play their games. But if you do want to get more out of it if you want to be able to squeeze out as much performance as possible then you definitely want to check out the custom firmware options for jealous you're going to have some quality of life improvements like save states when you're exiting the game and being able to load right back into them you're going to have access to a cpu governor setting which is going to let you set the device in different settings like performance so you can get some of these higher end systems running i was actually able to get pikmin for gamecube running for a little bit unfortunately i'm not able to replicate it but it is something i was able to do that's just not going to be possible at all in stock firmware that's not to say that gamecube is going to be even remotely playable there was just that one game and performance wasn't great i'm just using as an example to what could be 
possible when you go with something that is custom made for a device so yeah if you want to check out what the community has to offer go ahead and try one of the custom from our app there's a few you can choose from like jealous unofficial os arc os even though there isn't a, exactly a 353p image for arc os you can use a 353m1 and it should work no problem the nice thing is we have options if you want them and that's the nice thing about going with handheld that technically is new but it's actually been around for a while so is the rg 353ps worth it well that's really going to depend on who you are if you have other more powerful handhelds then no it's really not going to be able to offer anything that you can't already get from some other systems or even from another 353 device but if you're somebody that's just looking to get into handhelds and you want something that's going to look really good that's going to be very comfortable to use for longer play sessions but it's still going to be very pocketable then yeah, the answer is it's completely worth it. And even though there's other handhelds within this price range with the same chip, I would argue that this is the best of the bunch. Now, if you do want to go higher up, of course, there's going to be better choices. But just speaking within context, I think in the sub $100 category, you can't go wrong with the RG353 PS. But let me know what you think. Is there a better handheld out there for this price? Something else you would recommend? And if you do have other more powerful handhelds and are still going to pick up the RG353 PS, let me know why. I would love to hear it because honestly, the best part about the retro handhelds community is the interaction. And I always love hearing what other people have to say about things. Well, that's going to wrap it up. I really hope you enjoyed the video and I hope I made it easier for you to make a decision on whether you want to grab this handheld or not i know there's other resources out there so i really appreciate you spending the time to watch these videos i know we all do it means a lot to us and if you did like the video please don't forget to like and subscribe i hope to see you in the next video and have a great day